lot of what we'll be doing today is experiential. That will be trying it and experiencing mindfulness. Do, does anybody practice mindfulness at the moment? Yeah, we do. Okay, cause so quite a few. Uh, does anyone like to help? <laughs> Come up and help me. Um, so, sorry, my name is Louise Smith and I'm director of Do Be Mindful. Um, we work in schools primarily. We work with 300 schools at the moment. Um, and what we do is we always start off with staff. Uh, there's a lot of schools really interested in, in, I suppose, helping children with mindfulness. And because they know or they know a bit about uh, the benefits and a bit about the research, you know, the idea is, right, we want to help our kids. You know, we want to help our kids too. Mainly it's um, sort of biggest benefits, I suppose, for children is paying attention improves and their ability to self-regulate improves. So schools will say, I really want to do this with children. Um, and the idea is, you know, sh give me, your, you know, give me your, your lesson ideas and we'll do it. But you can't teach mindfulness unless you're in the right space. So you have to practice first and you have to self-regulate. And you have to learn all the skills and embody what you want the children to develop. Um, so we always work with teachers first, and, and support staff, and EYOs, and um, admin staff. Anybody can struggle with uh, you know, mental health, stress. Um, so the idea is that we work with, with everybody. We used to go into schools and do work, kind of, I suppose, <coughs> to teachers, if that's the right word. Uh, but now what we do is, well, what we realise very quickly, teachers are really busy and very time poor. So we've created everything online so that it fits into your life um, rather than you having to be somewhere at a certain time. The idea is that you work through it at your own pace and you you know, you know, fit it into your life. And, and again, when you come on to moving on to the children, it's online so that um, it is fed to you in a way that's, I, I suppose, I kind of thought about how I would do something, how I would like to learn something. Um, so what we offer is kind of a whole school approach to mindfulness. Um, we work first of all with staff, then the staff, so it's about building capacity in them to then teach mindfulness to their children. A lot of schools get experts in, and I was doing that for a long time, I was going into schools, but it's not sustainable. What, what, what happens is when that expert leaves, mindfulness kind of leaves. Um, so the idea is it's about helping the teachers to be more mindful, help them to manage their own uh, stress. And if that's as far as they go, if, if, if all they do is just the staff training, which is five, five weeks, one hour a week, roughly, as well as a daily practice, if that is all they do, then that will have an impact still on their practice, on, on their teaching practice, and on, on them as people, I suppose. Um, but we also then have programmes for children that we can go on to. And we also have things for parents, which is the box that the lady brought in. Um, because parents are the missing link. You could be doing so much work in, cl in class on self-regulation and, and helping them with their emotions and they create their glitter jars and all that kind of stuff. But if they're going home and it's <laughs> at home, then, you know, really it, it's tough. So. We work with parents and um, often the parents, well, in some of the schools we work with, uh, uh, you know, we've got, it's not always parents, it's, it's children that have, are care experienced and their representatives and we work with them together and it's, it's a nice way of kind of doing it. So hopefully that will give you a wee introduction to what we do, but I thought <coughs> rather than um, sort of talk at you, we'll actually, first of all, we'll do a wee practice. So we'll practice a bit of mindfulness just to help us just now and then what I thought I'd do is I would explain the benefits I know some of you perhaps already but I'll explain the benefits that have been uh, mindfulness is very much an evidence-based intervention so we'll look at the research a, a little a little bit of the research for adults and for children and um, and then we'll look very briefly at the science so what happens in the brain when you practice the the physiological changes that happen in the brain and um, and yeah, and then we'll have a bit of a, a chat about how it might help us and things. So if you want to put everything down that you're holding onto, 
and just get comfortable. So sit, um, I'm saying to the children, I say sit in a mindful body. But what I mean is, I sort of say that's not, it's about just sitting up. Uh, try not to have our back supported if, if that's comfortable. So actually sitting up herself, it just helps with, with her breathing. And then you just want to put your hands on your lap. You want to roll your shoulders down and back because most of you will sit like this. Just relax your shoulders. Try and relax your face, your jaw. And you can either, and you say this to children, you don't have to close your eyes. You can just look down at the floor or you can close your eyes. And we're only going to do a couple of minutes. We're going to do a, an arriving practice. So this is just about helping us to settle. Okay. So before we do it, if you just take a couple of deep breaths. So breathing in through the nose. Then out through the mouth. And each time you exhale, trying to relax a wee bit. So inhale through the mouth. Eh, inhale through the nose. Then exhale through the mouth. Then last time, inhale through the nose. And exhale through the mouth. So first of all, I want you to bring your attention to sitting in the chair. I want you to feel your weight pushing down through the sit bones in the chair, feeling heavy. And then bring your attention to your feet. So possibly noticing that you have feet for the first time in a good while. Noticing if you can feel your shoes, feel your ten toes. So bringing all the awareness to your feet. And then bringing your awareness to your breath. So noticing as you breathe in, the air is cool in your nostrils, and as you breathe out it's warmer. As you breathe in your chest expands, and as you breathe out it contracts. wanders off and you start to think about things and just gently bring it back again to your breath so maybe becoming aware of your abdomen as you breathe in it, it expands ever so slightly and as you breathe out it contracts so staying connected to your breath just simply noticing when your mind wanders off and then gently bringing it back to the breath. What do you notice? bringing your attention back again to sitting in the chair, so feeling the weight pushing down in the chair. You can open your eyes. So, what I'd like you to do is just, if there's three in a row or, you know, a couple in a row, is just turn to the teacher, sorry, you're sitting on your own, but just find someone. Um, just have a, a, a wee chat about that. So, what did you notice? Um, when you practiced, uh, uh, you did a, a very, very short um, mindful breathing practice. What did you notice when you did that? Just have a wee chat and then we'll, we'll talk about it in a few seconds. Okay. <laughs> 
Okay, thank you very much. So, if I can ask you just to see, what did you notice? Anything that you noticed about that? What we chatting about? I thought the dog. I thought I was doing really well, and then I just made sure you thought I was thinking about when I parked the car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I hadn't realised, I thought I was doing really well. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So, anyone else find that? Anyone find that they were yeah. Yeah, wandering off quite a bit? Um, and some people, when they sort of start to practice mindfulness and that happens, um, you know, maybe they'll try it for a few days and then they just say, well, I can't, I can't do meditation, I can't do mindfulness, and they, they jack it in. You know, they, they, they sort of think that's it, you know, it's not for me. And actually, what you did there, so you noticed that your mind had wandered and then you, you brought your attention back, that's the act of mindfulness. So, so, so what you were practicing when you were bringing your attention back was mindfulness. And mindfulness, John Kabat-Zinn, who's kind of like the, the godfather of mindfulness, if you like, he talks about, you know, the mind wanders a thousand times, you bring it back a thousand times. So it's not that some people can do it and some people can't, it's that it's difficult for anybody to practice mindfulness. I suppose as you practice it more, it's a bit like doing a sport or learning a language or, you know, it does become, I, I'd say there's times it's difficult still, like last weekend when my 16 year old came in drunk on Friday night. I could not practice on the Saturday morning, funnily enough. Uh, my mind was wandering a lot. Um, so there are days that it is still really difficult after kind of eight, I've done it for eight, eight or nine years. There are days it's very difficult still, um, because I suppose our mind, our, our gut's job is to secrete juices, and our mind's job is to think. You know, it, our its job. So it's do it. It's healthy. If your mind is wandering and you start to think about where you parked or the parrot outfit and is it okay or the feathers all over my house, whatever, <laughs> whatever it is, right? That is healthy. Your mind's doing its job. And by practicing mindfulness, what we're trying to do is bringing our attention back, guiding it back very gently and compassionately, guiding it back again to what we're focusing on. So we chose our breath there, but it could be sound. So I became quite aware of, I don't know if anyone else was noticing the projector. So you can be mindful of other things. It doesn't have to be the breath. Um, but anyway, interesting. So you noticed that you had thoughts. Uh, we have, our, on average, 60,000 thoughts a day um, and about 95% of those thoughts tend to be the same as the day before. That was actually in my presentation, I didn't just steal it from Claire, <laughs> I actually had that in my presentation. Um, Harvard University did a, a big study around um, thoughts and, and kind of how, I don't know how they did it and she said the same, um, but on average we have 60,000 thoughts a day and we tend to have the same thoughts over and over again. Um, so that act of mindfulness is just becoming a wee bit more aware of our thoughts and bringing our attention back again to whatever we want. So what else did you notice when you did that practice? You noticed you were thinking anything else? Just grounding. I found the noise really helpful, which kind of takes us over. It's quite grounding. Good. So <coughs> felt grounded. You felt like um, so. So sometimes when you do get that and I use it quite a bit um, during the day is you know we do get that feeling of like you're running around crazy something you can do and it can only be sometimes like three breaths you're just sitting feeling um, you know feet seat breath feet seat breath feet seat breath so feeling your feet on the floor noticing you're sitting on a chair connecting with the breath that's the kind of uh, three sort of things that I try and remember when you're when you're your mind's sort of getting quite <coughs> overwhelmed and you're starting to go, oh my God, how am I going to do this? This is, this is crazy. Feet, seat, breath. It's really noticing them, becoming aware of them. Uh, my
my kind of reasons for getting into mindfulness is mental health. So my eldest is 19 and I think really since he was born I've struggled with mental health and um, with depression and anxiety are the two things that have really, I suppose at certain times floored me, that's probably the word, is completely kind of, I don't know how you want to describe it, whipped the floor from under me at times. Um, when he was born I was in a very toxic relationship and I always wonder if it's the relationship that kind of led to the depression and anxiety or if it was being depressed and anxious that kept me in, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but I had my eldest and then I went on to have my little boy, uh, my middle son Finn who's started his job today, so I'm very <laughs> proud. Um, and got out of that relationship but what I found was that I was still completely anxious, completely overwhelmed, um, really struggled. But on on the outside, you know, because even that, you know, I'm talking about sort of nearly 15, 16 years ago, you really genuinely didn't want to sort of say you had anything wrong with you. You know, it was okay to say, I had a sickness and diarrhea bug. <laughs> but you could not say, even to mum and dad, you know, and friends and things like that, I never really said, I'm struggling, you know, I'm having these crazy thoughts, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm drinking all the time, you know, I was drinking pretty much every single night, um, what, I'm feeling I can't, don't want to go out, I'm, you know, I'm really struggling, I didn't want to say that, so I was kind of like, got my clothes on, my makeup on, and I had a good job, and, and so on the face of it, I was okay, but actually I wasn't, I was really, really struggling. And I remember the first time going to the doctors, and I think Jacob was nine, so I kind of battled for nine years and then gave in. And they put me on antidepressants, that was, that was the, the first thing. And then I would start to feel okay and want to get off them, and it was then coming off the antidepressants, I would relapse. And it was that constant relapse that I really struggled with. I, I, I was quite impatient, you know, I'd say, well, why do I need a wee tablet to feel okay? want to be able to get off these so I, I, it was a doctor um, maybe eight years ago that I'd never met before that said you're struggling with relapse and um, have you ever thought of trying mindfulness and he went on to describe what mindfulness was and he said you pay attention to your thoughts and, and I just looked at the guy I was the sort of person at that time that used to leave yoga before the relaxation bit at the end mm -hmm. because that was just for those kind of folk, <laughs> hippy dippy, <laughs> hippy dippy stuff. Um, so when he spoke about mindfulness, because again at that time I probably hadn't heard the word before, it wasn't like now when you go on Instagram and everybody's mindful and everybody's dogs are mindful. And <laughs> uh, but at that time I remember thinking, you're what? You know, how dare you talk to me about paying attention to my breath? Like, you know, what's that gonna do? Um, and I was really angry at the guy, I remember like just grabbing my prescription and kind of storming off. But something stuck in my head uh, and I was Googling mindfulness and there was a huge amount of stuff that came up, so, you know, it was great for insomnia. So one of the things that I was struggling with was insomnia. Um, you know, I would go to my bed most nights at whatever, 10 o'clock, but it would take me until nearly it was time to get up to fall asleep. And, um, and I used to think, if I ran more, that it would help my sleep. So I, I was up to running something like, before I went to the doctor with, you know, when I, Jacob was about nine, I was up to running 13 miles a day, <laughs> daily, to then try and wear me out. And actually it, it wasn't, you know, I was still getting this, I was, I was wired, if you like, but, but, but tired. Um, so when it said it helps insomnia, I was like, right, I'm <laughs> absolutely right there. I'm gonna give it a go. And um, I signed up to an eight week mindfulness course. So the one that we have is five weeks. Uh, the one that I did was eight weeks and um, it was run by a guy who I still, uh, I'm still in touch with, Avinash. And he explained at the time that you can come to the classes, so you can do the online stuff, you can come to a class and learn the techniques. And that's great and you'll love it and you feel very relaxed. You kind of float home afterwards. Um, but if you don't do the practice, if you don't actually then practice the techniques, then nothing will change. You know, your well-being won't improve. You'll just en enjoy your class, if that makes sense. Um, so what I noticed, we, we were given homework, uh, 
most weeks and it would be like you know you've got to practice a 40 minute body scan every day for seven days and I used to detest it the first kind of few weeks I detested it I used to think why am I doing this nothing's going to change just what you're saying my head was wandering all the time into the past all the time I'm going to let that happen what was not you know all that kind of stuff um, and because I was used to being on the go continuously I found it really difficult sitting down was difficult I would be far more productive cleaning you know that was the other thing I was obsessive with cleaning all the time and you know doing things all the time so sitting was difficult but after a few weeks of daily practice and I committed to the practice I was very much if I'm going to do this I'm going to do it 100 percent and after a few weeks of doing it every day and not feeling any different something shifted and there was this kind of calmness that I don't think I've experienced before and also this ability to stop and notice what was going on and then react if you like and that was something then that I've kind of I've just practiced it for many many years and um, and now you know help children. My, my middle son wouldn't touch it with a barge pole. My eldest son does actually practice mindfulness himself. He uses the Headspace app and just shoves it in and just uh, he does uh, you know, 10 minutes or whatever. Um, my youngest does it. So she's only four and she has done it, I think because of where I was, she's done it from three dogs. So she'll ask me to do it now. Can we practice mindfulness with her? And it's something that you know obviously helps her. So so that's, um, that's, I suppose, why I got into it. People practice it for many reasons, though, not always because of mental health. Sometimes it's to improve performa uh, performance. If you get a lot of sports, um, people practicing mindfulness, because it really helps when it comes to improving performance. Like say Djokovic, the tennis player, talks about uh, mindfulness a lot. Um, so you don't have to, well, I suppose I'm saying, you don't have to be struggling to practice mindfulness you can do it. it's a great preventative um, tool if you like and when I, I'm talking to children that's what I talk about I say tell me things that you do for your body and they'll say oh I play football and I go dancing and I whatever you know gymnastics tell me what you do to look after your hair well I wash it and right, tell me what you do to look after your mind and a lot of them go I don't know because I think culturally really in our culture to sort of do things to look after our mind so mindfulness for that you know is simply something that they can uh, I suppose you don't do mindfulness but you can practice to then help when it comes to uh, your, your your mental health if you like so benefits of mindfulness and sorry there's nothing I, I did have this all written out but I can send you the, the, the slides so benefits of mindfulness um, there are many there's many that are kind of spoken about and, and thrown about, but the ones that we'll kind of stick to is, you know, there's been a huge amount of research on mindfulness in adults. It's for roughly 30 years, they've kind of started off, I mentioned John Kabat-Zinn at the beginning there. He started the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Programme at the University of Massachusetts in the States. And he basically recruited people that were struggling with chronic pain so it wasn't actually to do initially with uh, kind of mental health. It was people that were struggling with chronic pain that could no longer be helped, if you like, um, with traditional medicine. And he put them through an eight-week mindfulness-based stress reduction program. And funnily enough, at the end of the program, they were experiencing far less pain. And they had a better relationship with the pain that, that you know, if they were still um, having pain. Uh, but also well-being had improved, so levels of depression had decreased and anxiety had decreased and sleeping had improved and things. So it was him that really kind of pioneered it and it's his programme that people take and adapt to, to, to suit their institutions and things. Um, what the research has found is that there's various benefits. So there's kind of physical benefits, so things like you've got less cortisol in the body, lower blood pressure it kind of affects blood pressure um, so there are physical benefits and there's we've spoken about some of the mental benefits but also cognitive benefits and this is where it becomes really interesting for children so it really improves memory and concentration um, to do with you know, the, the different parts of the brain that are kind of stimulated if you like so we just think we're sitting 
paying attention to her breath, but actually there's stuff going on. And they can tell that uh, from the neuroimage scans that they can do. So they can take a scan of someone's brain that's never practiced mindfulness, and then they can scan the brain again after about eight weeks of practice. And what they found is that there's physiological changes in the brain um, in different areas of the brain. So the first area, has anyone heard of the amygdala? The amygdala, fight, flight, freeze response. You will see children in this, uh, you'll see yourself in it at times, you know, fight, flight, freeze response. When you are feeling overwhelmed and very, very stressed, you just need to run away. You need to just, you want to stop and zone out. Um, or you want to, what was the other one? Freeze, flight, run, or fight. fight. Yeah, fight. Uh, 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 so you'll, you'll understand. The amygdala is doused when you practice mindfulness. And that is true again of children. So what you tend to find if they are doing a daily practice, because um, we've had, I can give you case studies and stuff, and it was a school that actually, the issue was violence, the issue was behavior. And they looked at the impact of mindfulness on the children and they were P5s, so they were young, uh, young kids. And actually, um, it's really improved the children's ability to self-regulate. That was the thing the, the teacher found. She had tried so many things and charts and, and nothing was working. Um, and the kids, they are about to speak on my video in a wee while uh, about what they get from mindfulness. So it helps children, it helps us to self-regulate. The amygdala is doused. <coughs> the other part of the brain is at the front, the prefrontal cortex. So kind of higher brain, the last part of the brain to be formed, um, all your executive functions are here, things like problem solving, thinking creatively, um, you know, being empathetic, being kind, um, being focused, being, you know, paying attention, all these uh, executive functions are up here. The, so the prefrontal cortex is stimulated. And then the last part of, the, there's, there's many other parts of the brain that are changed but the kind of three main parts the hippocampus uh, which is responsible for learning and memory which is really interesting when it comes to, to the kids so I've kind of bombarded you with uh, benefits and the science and things and I'm you know I'm not a neuroscientist but um, I know that there are changes and it's quite interesting when it comes to if you're doing any work on ACEs in schools anyone doing kind of work on ACEs um, because often I'll go into schools to model lessons for the children and the teacher will be like, oh, they just don't pay attention, it's really frustrating because they're giggling and they're da 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 And actually it's about explaining, you know, when a child has had traumatic experiences, high ACEs and things, they cannot, their brain is actually uh, wired so differently to a child that hasn't had these experiences that often they will be the children in your class that will find it difficult that won't want to close their eyes. You know, they will hold a stone instead or feel much more comfortable holding something than concentrating on their own body, which is absolutely acceptable and absolutely, you know, should be encouraged. But they will be the children that if you stick with it and you don't give up after a couple of weeks, they will be the children that you'll notice the biggest difference in. If you look up autism and and ADHD and mindfulness and stuff. It is fantastic. Yeah. Any que I feel like I'm off on tangents. So any questions? I don't have my PowerPoint to keep me on the straight and narrow. Any questions so far? Yeah. Sorry that I'm kind of rushing through it, but I thought we would do another practice um, and have a wee chat about that and then move on to, to the next bit. I'm due to finish, what time? Is it 10 past? Ten past. Ten past. So we'll sit, we'll come into a mindful body again, so sitting back up. You can take, feel free to take your, your shoes off if you want, I often do. Um, and then folks are like, no, that's too heavy. <laughs> so come into the, not to the edge of your seat, but you want to um, not have your back supported if you can, unless it's uncomfortable and then just sit back. So we'll start off the same way as we did before. We'll roll our shoulders back and down so you're creating space in the neck. And then I want you to give your face permission to relax. So really relax the jaw and 
your frown lines, really relax the face. bringing your attention again to sitting in the chair first of all so noticing your weight pushing down noticing the connection of your sit bones to the chair noticing the backs of your thighs in the chair noticing your hands on your lap is there any heat can you feel any heat from your hands on your lap noticing them And then bringing your attention again to your feet. Can you feel your feet? So it's not thinking about your feet. I want you to try and feel your feet. Notice what's happening in your feet. And then take a breath in. And as you exhale, move your attention to your calves. Your shins. What do you notice in your calves and your shins? Exhale, bringing your attention to your knees, the backs of the knees, and your thighs. And what's going to happen is your mind's going to start wandering off again. And I want you to notice and bring it back each time to the part of the body that you're concentrating on. So the knees and the thighs, what do you feel? Can you feel the clothes that you're wearing? Any sensations, any itchiness or tingling or anything? Becoming aware of what is happening in your body. And then taking a breath in. And as you exhale, bringing your awareness to your stomach. Do you notice your stomach rising when you breathe in and falling as you breathe out? What do you notice about your stomach? Is Are you holding it in tightly? Is it relaxed? Exhale, you bring your attention up to your chest. Noticing what you notice. And bringing your mind back, bringing your attention back if it's wandered off, bringing it back to the chest. Tension as you breathe in and then exhale, bringing your attention up to your shoulders and your neck. We often carry a lot of tension in our shoulders and our neck. How do they feel right now? So not not trying to make them feel a certain way, just how do they feel right now? Again, just noticing thoughts, noticing opinions, if this is boring, you can't concentrate, noticing that and bringing your attention gently back again to your shoulders and your neck.
and then feeling. Exhale, bringing your attention to your hands, to your fingers. Becoming aware of your fingers. How do they feel? Are they warm? Are they cold? What do you notice? Inhaling, exhaling, bringing your attention up your arms, just starting off in the wrists and then working your way up the arms, noticing any tension and trying with each exhale just to soften, to relax. Again, and you notice that it has and you bring it back to your arms. It's okay, it's okay, relax. And when you're inhaling, as you exhale, bringing your attention to your face. Notice your jaw, what is happening in your jaw happening in your face? Can you relax your face? What do you notice in your body right now? What sensations do you feel? And then taking one last deep breath in. And as you exhale, noticing the weight of your body again, pressing down in the chair. And again, you can open your eyes. <coughs> okay, that was ever so slightly longer than we did before. What I thought we'll do for a couple of minutes is just to chat again um, just however many there are. What did you notice? That's the first thing. What did you notice? And then how did you feel? Okay, that's two things I want you to, to chat about. All right. <laughs> Okay, just thank you all again. I'm sorry that I'm rushing you. Um, just share some of that. What did you notice? What did you notice? Kind of What's that? Sorry, okay. <laughs> Okay, interesting. So you could, when you brought your attention to, yeah. was there anywhere particular that you found very tingly? My hands. Your hands. Yes. Do you notice that normally? Okay, why not? I wouldn't yeah. notice that. You're not aware, yeah, you're not paying attention, mm -hmm. yeah. So you're often in automatic pilot, yeah. yeah? And, you, and if you're anything like everybody else, you're running about like crazy. Yeah. So that tingling is happening all the time. Often mm -hmm. the first thing people will say, and children, adults and children will say is, I felt sore. We noticed that they had mm -hmm. sore parts. Mm -hmm. 
They've always been sore. Mm -hmm. They've always been there. The body's always giving me the niggles, but we're not listening. Okay, we're running around like crazy. Children will say that as well. Oh, I didn't like that. Why not? Because I felt I've got sore shoulders. Okay, we've always got sore. We, you know, we, we just don't notice. Okay, what else did you notice? When you did it, what else did you, apart from sensations, what else did you notice? Did you like it? Did you not? Did you, how did you feel? Tell me what, 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 you, what you did. Easier that time. Okay. Yeah. Any particular reason? Just, just, just focus better. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And we kind of ran through it very quickly. So normally in a body scan, you would take a lot longer, mm -hmm. and you would, uh, you know, really concentrate. And I would talk about the different parts and what they do and how the calves hold lots of emotion and all that. Kind of. So we would really take our time. But we were, you know, we we were limited. But that was a bit easier to stay focused. Anyone find it more difficult that time? Did anyone else feel almost like, does anyone ever before you fall asleep at night you jerk yeah. yourself away? Yeah. Okay. Do you know what that is? Do you know the different parts of the nervous system? There's there's two there's the parasympathetic nervous system, okay? And there's a the sympathetic, so you're always doing <coughs> you know, that kind of mode. Your heart's pumping away inside. When you fall into the, the parasympathetic nervous system, so you were relaxing there, you were practicing mm -hmm. relaxation, well, we weren't we were practicing the body scan, but um, that jerk was you, um, your body uh, almost reacting to you going into parasympathetic mm -hmm. mode. You were actually, um, that's actually a good thing.